Hello, it's four o'clock on the East Coast, and I'm here in Merrill Auditorium. I'm Shereen Chahawi. This is the executive. I'm the executive director of the Friends of the Kachmar Organ. I am here with the Kachmar Organ Council, but more importantly, I am here with James Kennerly, Portland's municipal organist. We have a concert coming up next Saturday on August 21st at 7 p.m. live with a live audience here in Merrill Auditorium. And James is here today to practice, but also to spend a few minutes on this Facebook Live to give people a sense of this concert, what they can expect, and the fun we're gonna have, because I've been listening to him practice for the last 20 minutes, and I assure you we are gonna have fun next Saturday. Um, the other thing that's uh, happening is we will not have a live stream on Saturday night, but we will make a recording of the concert available um, later in the week. And those tickets are also available. Tickets for both online access and for the live performance are all available through portix.com, or you can just go directly to our website, FOKO, for Friends of the Kachmar Organ, um, FOKO.org. So either way, portix.com or foco.org to get your tickets uh, and to see more about the concert. But more importantly, let's have James tell us about the concert. Um, so James, I'm gonna let you come on out. Hi everyone, it's great to be here. It's lovely to welcome you all to this wonderful concert hall, which it is always such a pleasure whenever I come in here to, to practice for a, for a show. It is just such an unbelievable pleasure to be here. And as I said last time we did one of these live shows, to be making live music and planning to perform is quite an extraordinary thing in this day and age where we're so used to being shut down and locked out and to have access to this magnificent organ is really just such a blessing. So it's awesome to be here. Um, and I thought, as Shereen said, it might be fun to talk a little bit about the program that you are hopefully going to hear either here in person or online, or maybe both. That would be cool too. Um, and I think that we'll also be, be streaming just the audio only as well, if, you, if that's your, your preference. Um, so maybe I'll start by talking. I know if you have any questions, please put them in the comments and we will certainly answer them. Um, unless it's when are you going to stop talking, in which case I'll probably start playing. Um, so I thought maybe I'd start with a few measures or a few pages of a new arrangement I did of a very, very, very famous piece by John Philip Sousa, the American March King, and this is the Stars and Stripes Forever, which really is his most popular uh, march, of course, originally for military band. He worked with the, um, the, the um, United States Marine Band and then composed this piece, and I think it brought him something like 500 pounds in his life, $500 in his lifetime, which is worth millions and millions of dollars today. So it, this one piece kept him um, fairly comfortable throughout his career. And it gives us some challenges as organists because we're always trying to make arrangements of orchestral pieces, pieces for band, um, also pieces for solo instruments, for the piano or the harpsichord. But this piece is, of course, for more instruments than just one player. It's for an entire band of, of, of wind instruments, percussion instruments, brass instruments, and within those we have the trumpets, the trombones, the tubas, the French horns, the saxophones, the oboes, the clarinets, the flutes, the piccolos, the bassoons. The, um, the challenge is how to combine all of those into a pipe organ um, that really does have all of those sounds. I've mentioned this before, but we have um, sounds that, that imitate those instruments. Here's a French horn. And here's another French horn. Here is an English horn. Here is an oboe. Here's a beautiful clarinet. Here is a set of bagpipes. You always need those for an orchestral transcription. Sounding suitably out of tune on this lovely summer's day. Um, I should tell you that the weather outside is absolutely stunning. It's a beautiful blue sky. It's about 80 degrees. Um, and so I hope at least some of you are watching this from the comfort of your outside areas where you're able to enjoy the sun and the music. Um, 
But back to this transcription. So we have all those instruments in the orchestra, all those instruments on the organ. So how do we decide how and what and why um, to play? We won't get too philosophical today, but I'll show you some ideas that I have. So this piece is famous because of the melody. The first time, the theme comes up in what's called the trio section. So not right at the beginning. It sounds like this. Etc. Legend has it, I think, that Sousa heard somebody whistling that melody, and so he incorporated that or a version of it, who knows, um, into the final version. Now, what he told the press, this is from the composer from the horse's mouth himself, is that that was to represent the northern part of the United States. So it comes up three times, very important. The third time, it adds a very famous piccolo lick, a piccolo melody. Um, and we have a wonderful um, stop on this organ called a piccolo. So I'm able to select that. I probably would use something slightly different, perhaps more like this. So that gives that nice um, piccolo sound, and that's combined with the melody. I think it's played by the wind instruments in the score. Etc. Now, the third time I mentioned it comes up. So that second time, this is meant to represent the southern part of the United States. We have the north combined with the south. And at the very end, if any of you have played in a military band or a marching band, you'll know that the, the trombones have a very important part at the very end of this piece. Um, the trombones are often played, they're bass instruments, really tenor instruments. So I'm going to play them with my feet, of course, no hands, and it sounds like this. <laughs> change a few notes to make it work because I only have one foot um, that can play that melody. The other foot has to play the bass part. And so what I thought it would be fun to do is show you how I put this arrangement, which I will be the first time performing it this, um, at this concert, so in a week's time. Um, and here is the, the first time that melody comes up. It's pretty simple. Um, I have to find what settings I am on. So I'm going to go down to the level where I've saved all the sounds. Um, so this is what it sounds like the first time. So it's just the melody, just the north. So you see that I've got my bass in the foot, the beat, and I have my accompaniment in the left hand. So for most normal people, that would be enough. You have your melody in one hand, you have your accompaniment in the other, and you have your bass part in the feet. Um, but us organists, there's, there's something wrong with us, and we always try and make things more complicated than they need to be. So I mentioned that's the first time. The second time the melody comes up, we have the tune, and we have, which is the north, we have the piccolo melody, which is meant to be the south, and then we have to do the bass part, and then we have to do the accompaniment. So there are a few little fun ways that I did that. Here is how I do the bass part. So I'm gonna play it with my foot. Oh, I just noticed there's a stop missing. Um, as a fact, it's not playing. We'll get that fixed by next week. Um, and then I add the accompaniment with my right foot. And then I have the melody with my left hand. Oops. Um, and then I have to play the rest of the accompaniment with my other hand, but I can't play the accompaniment on the same keyboard. That would sound clumsy. So what I actually do is I play one part of it with one hand, with my thumb on one keyboard, and the rest of it on the keyboard above. And we call 
all that thumbing down. It's very useful in pipe organ transcriptions. So now we've got the accompaniment in the left hand and the pedal. We've got the bass parts in the left foot. And we've got the tune in the left thumb. Remember there's something missing and that's the piccolo part. So that's what my right hand is for. So the right hand plays a... So I'm going to combine them together and you'll see how we get to this. So here is the bass, accompaniment, and the melody. And the melody with the piccolo part as well. Etc. Um, but then at the very end, we have all of those bits plus the trombone melody. So how on earth are we going to do that? Well, it's the similar kind of thing. The piccolo is in the right hand. Sounds like this. The tune is in the left hand, um, on the thumb, left thumb. And then the accompaniment is in the left hand up on the keyboard here. left foot and the, um, the trombone part which represents the west of the country so it's all three brought together at the end the great union of the United States sounds like this so if I combine all those together you'll see why we are such crazy people us organists <laughs> concert to hear the whole of that um, but that's just a little glimpse into how we make these transcriptions as organists and I mentioned there are percussion um, parts as well and I'll just give you a very quick tour of that because there's a very famous part um, called the break and that's when the music goes a little bit crazy and departs from that nice sort of melodic tune and in this piece it sounds like this <laughs> symbols there um, in my left hand. And I can use my feet in that sort of ta 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 rhythm and that gives the impression of all of that energy of a full, um, full band playing. So those are some of the tricks behind this transcription but it will be really really fun to perform this for the first time on Saturday April, uh, August the 21st. So um, let's see what's next. I have another march by Sousa the Liberty Bell March, which has always been one of my favorites. I once, once heard it on a recording, I think, by Carlo Curley, and I always loved the sound. I also loved the sound of the organ, and I think it was on the, the organ at Girard College in Philadelphia. Wonderful um, E.M. Skinner, and you know, a very, very archetypal American sounding organ. Didn't really sound like anything that I grew up with in the UK. And that really is what's fascinating and wonderful about the Kochmar organ. It's, it's in essence, an American organ. It has these massive, massive uh, tonal color possibilities. So I could play pretty much any music from any composer um, with strings or with woodwinds or with brass or percussion, and all of the sounds are as exciting or more exciting even than the full real orchestra playing them. And that's one of the things that makes this organ and I think American symphonic organs so very exciting. Um, maybe I'll play a little bit of the Liberty Bell March, in case you guys don't know that one. And again, there's some percussion. I think I use the Glockenspiel here, which is a fun little stop to use.
etc. Um, and this has lots of fun percussion as well, um, and orchestral effects and cymbals and tambourines and, and the solo tubers. Don't be disarmed, uh, alarmed, sorry, um, by the name. It's more like a trumpet sound. And then we have two of them. What, that's the, the sort of so-called harmonic tuba, and there's a really loud one called the tuba magna. Um, you might hear that some of these notes are a little bit out of tune, um, and that's because the, the, the sun and the humidity, the heat, um, really wreak havoc on pipe organs because the metal and the wood all moves at different um, stages and some pipes get sharper or flatter and then they move out of tune with each other. Um, but rest assured when we have the concert this organ will be impeccably in tune. Thank you so much to our organ curators David Wallace and his son Nick. They're absolutely wonderful um, and, and I don't know how they managed to tune all 7,101 pipes of this organ so beautifully and so quickly. Um, but, but that's a fun little fact. They're here at just about every concert, sometimes inside the organ. Uh, I think it was last Christmas or the Christmas before, I was playing actually an improvisation, and there was a note that stuck on, I think it was this one. And I was playing and I thought, oh boy. So I had to make something out of it, which is what, sort of what we do as organists. So I thought, oh, I'll just play a little. And see if it's gonna stop. And it didn't. So then I just kept going. and it didn't stop, so I think I just made a little something like that. And then they went inside and fixed it real, um, in real time, live, so that was quite extraordinary. So I hope nothing like that happens this time either. <laughs> so I wonder, Shireen, if, if you have any questions, please shout them out, otherwise I can keep um, babbling on about all of this wonderful music. We do, and we have somebody listening in from Germany. Oh, fantastic, good um, comment. Oh yes. So, I played a few of them, and I should start by saying that most organs, most pipe organs, are made up of a chorus of sounds. I'm pulling out these white things you can't quite see, um, but all of these make noise, um, and when I pull more of them out I make more sound. But your classic pipe organ sounds a little bit like this. a diapason or a principal chorus and those pipes look a bit like the ones that you can not quite see behind you but if you ever see a picture of a pipe organ those pipes are those sounds they're very bright they are um, absolutely unique to the organ they don't try and imitate an instrument or anything like that they're just pipe organ sounds now this organ has lots of other sounds I showed you the imitative sounds of the orchestra a little bit earlier on um, I played the, the tubers which really sound like trumpets the big one the quiet one etc. Now, there are toys, and I played a few of those earlier. Here are some chimes, so this is like somebody's knocking at your front door, or if you're in the olden days. And there's a piece I'm playing by a composer called Dudley Peel uh, in the program called Temple Bells, and it uses those lovely um, bells as the centerpiece of the composition. So that's one fun thing. A lot of pipe organs, though, have chimes, so maybe that's not quite so unusual. Now, how about the other one? Here's a glockenspiel. So that's pretty fun. Um, here is a marimba. Here is a xylophone. Here is a carillon, it's really a, uh, it's meant to sound like a harp. And that is located, it might be hard for you to tell, but way up in the ceiling, about 75 feet above our heads, in what we call the echo division, or the antiphonal division. And really, I should be playing that on this top keyboard. We have five 
keyboards, we call them manuals. Manual is Latin, um, manus means hand, so manuals are the ones we play with our hands. Um, and really, as I say, that plays from the top keyboard because the top keyboard controls that echo and antiphonal division. Um, so then we have the, the unpitched sounds. That means that they're not designed to sound like a xylophone or a glockenspiel. Um, here is a very fun Turkish symbol. We have a triangle. I'll use that a lot in this concert. There's a bell. Imagine you're in a graveyard scene in a movie. Um, if you're being chased by a horse, then of course you have the hoops. If there is a fire or you're being chased around by a fire engine, you have the fire gong. Um, if there's a train coming, which you probably want to move out of the way, somebody rings at your door, well, I already used this one, just push the doorbell. Um, if someone's in your way and you're driving, you use the car horn. And if you're in a beautiful mountainous scene and the little birds are tweeting, ah, you have the bird stop. So those are some of the fun toy stops when they're up in the top of the organ, we call that the penthouse. Um, and we also have some more conventional percussion. Here is a snare drum. And you may know that from some famous movies. Uh, so the snare drum is really fun, and we also have a bass drum. So this is literally a bass drum which is struck by a mechanical um, mallet whenever I push down the foot pedal in this case. So I always like to think about maybe a military scene. Um, just by using my hands and my feet. And, and then we also have our bass drum roll. if something fun is about to jump out at the circus. And then we have some symbols. Here's a tap symbol. And here is a big crash symbol. And if you want to create that real sense of excitement and crescendo, we have a roll symbol. So all of those are real instruments that if we had a human upstairs, they would just be playing them. Um, but we're able, through the magic of this technology, um, which comes from the 1920s, to play all of those fun sounds, but as a single organist. So I think I showed you at the very beginning with that um, arrangement of Stars and Stripes. Well, I'll play the very beginning of it, and you'll see how I can pull on those instruments just like I had a whole bunch of percussionists standing behind the organ facade. <laughs> sounds, um, especially in this concert. So those are the toy stops. Yes, so how did this program idea come about? Well, I spend my life thinking about music, um, which is the wonderful privilege that I have. And, and that's not just 
practicing it and performing it, but also thinking about ideas for programs. Because when we come up with a program, if you're a, an orchestral conductor or a choral conductor, a band director, you don't just say, oh, I like this piece, this piece, this piece, and perform it. We really try and think very carefully, a little bit like a curator of an art gallery might say, well, I'm not just going to stick these pieces up on a wall. I'm going to think very carefully about what, this, what story this, um, this canvas tells, or this sketch, or maybe this little commentary, or this little video. Um, and in a very similar way, I always try and make these programs a little bit like touring a gallery. And of course, we weren't able to perform um, during the summer, as we normally would, we would normally have an extended series of summer concerts that really have a history of, of, of strong patriotism to them. This was a very American thing to do. The organ was an archetypal American instrument. Um, and so I wanted to make reference to some of those feelings and those sentiments, um, but maybe from slightly unusual angles. So of course, Stars and Stripes is a very well-known piece. Um, I think everybody understands what, what that piece says. But there was another piece that um, one of our board members, um, Peter Plum, who is a wonderful organist himself, he, he showed me this piece of music in front of me about three or four years ago. And it's called America the Beautiful. It was written by Will McFarlane, and he was the first municipal organist here in Portland in 1912. And it was written um, as a musical setting of, of, um, of the Catherine Lee Bates' America the Beautiful tune, uh, sorry, the, the poem, um, which didn't at that time come with a melody. So the words were written first, they were circulated, they were becoming very popular, and dozens of composers took to writing musical settings. Now, we all know the, the one that became the default melody. <laughs> um, but at the time, there were lots of melodies, and legend has it, in fact, more than legend, uh, because Catherine Lee Bates' brother, Arthur, lived here in Portland and, of course, knew um, Will McFarlane, the organist. Now, when he composed his version of this piece, which is called America the Beautiful, and it sounds like this. A beautiful, for spacious sky, etc. You all know the words, but you probably don't know that tune. Um, it, it made me think of the connections that we have here in Portland with the municipal organ and the municipal organists and how close we came to being on the world stage because of the fame of that piece and of, of one of um, our predecessors here at the hall. So that piece was turned into a march and I'll play a little bit of it for you because you can hear the style of it. incorporated into this piece. So I've always wanted to perform that piece and I thought it would be fun then with all of those influences to build a program around America, America. And that's why all of, of the pieces, apart from one, actually, um, and even that one is Spirit, are by American composers. And that piece is by Leon Gesso, who was born in Germany, um, with a name like Leon. You would think he was perhaps from France or Switzerland. Um, but he was half American. His mother was American. So I figured he got to to come into the mix. Um, and that piece was really one of the most popular pieces in American theaters and cinemas at the time, and with marching bands. And if I play a little bit of it, you might even recognize it. <laughs> It's a really, really fun piece called The Parade of the Tin Soldiers. And at the end, you know, they're marching along, and then there's this um, mighty gush of wind. Sounds something like this. Uh, no, that's not the right one. Let's see. Oh, there we go. And then they all blow over. Um, and so I thought that would be 
be a really fun piece to play, and honorarily American because he was, he was born of an American mother. Um, but the rest of the pieces, like Samuel Barber, the wonderful adagio for strings, many of you will know that piece, um, often performed, originally written for, as part of his string quartet, but often performed by a, the much larger or arrangement for string orchestra that he made in the same year in 1936. Um, and then we have pieces, I think maybe I'll talk about Florence Price, who is a wonderful composer whose name I had not come across until a couple of years ago. And a friend of mine played the, one of the organ pieces and I was just really captivated. And then I later heard that same performance on Pipe Dreams, which is the um, fantastic um, NPR you may have heard or you may have listened on their website. Pipe Dreams is run by Michael Barone, who's a very good friend of ours here at the Cottermore Organ. Um, and it was uh, a Juneteenth program, so uh, a very, 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 very thorough and exciting and unusual um, repertoire that we're not used to as organists, um, because it just wasn't part of the mainstream for many, many years. And so I started re researching her music, and it seemed that she was really the first uh, African-American female composer to have a piece performed by a major American symphony orchestra. And she was an organist in the 1930s and 40s in Chicago. She grew up in Arkansas, studied at New England Conservatory in Boston. And so the organ, even though she was known, I think is probably most well known as an orchestral composer, the organ music is tremendous fun. Here is the opening of the Suite for Organ, which I think is just a fabulous piece. Now, if I play this, you, will, you might hear echoes of uh, Tchaikovsky or Beethoven or Dvorak. But as we move through, it's possible, I think, to hear some of her southern influences, the influence of spirituals, of the emerging jazz harmonies, um, and particularly of African-American dance, especially in the last movement. There's a dance, African-American dance, called the juba, which she uses. It's very ry rhythmic and syncopated, and, and, and a wonderful synthesis of those styles and more traditional European orchestral styles. So here is the beginning of the suite by Florence Price. <laughs> Set might seem like a very sort of traditional European. It's in C minor, the echoes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, etc. But listen to some of those wonderful harmonies. I'm going to use slightly quieter sounds so you can hear them here. So this is from the beginning. Those wonderful, we call them parallel chords because they're all moving in the same direction. that came out of a jazz number, you would not be surprised. Um, and it is also typical of that more extended harmonic language of the, the middle of the 20th century. Um, but, but very, very wonderful music, and then uh, wonderful music. Uh, where's another little part that I was going to show you? Here's a wonderful false relation that, again, you could easily hear in jazz or in gospel or something. So we have our B natural normally those two notes would not be friends but when you play them together and so it sounds again like we could almost be in a jazz club very evocative music wonderfully um, luscious harmonies and I wonder if I go to the very end of this piece this is the there are four separate movements and this is called the toccato normally it's toccata with an a but this toccato with an o at the end um, and that's what Florence Price, Price chose as the name um, and you'll hear that the rhythm ta 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 ta
And you'll hear another thing there, which is called the pentatonic scale. So Western scales are traditionally made up of seven notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then they repeat. And the pentatonic scale, which is very prevalent in, in lots of um, um, African-American music and music from the Far East and folk music in general from the Americas and from um, Western Europe and Russia, really all over the world, is based on five notes. And then it repeats. And that is shared, as I say, with, with musics from all across the world. Um, and here, listen to the melody. It just uses those five pentatonic notes. So again, perhaps a hark back to Florence Price's um, Southern Roots and her um, upbringing, surrounded by spirituals and all of that wonderful, wonderful gospel music. And of course, it's combined with the um, what we call modulation, so it changes key and chromaticism when you use some of the other notes in between the, the sort of the white notes, as it were, on the keyboard. And I think that's what makes this piece really successful. So the second idea of this melody has a chromatic idea. Um, sounds like this. Yes, so someone is wondering where, basically how the organ w relates to the piano. Of course, on a piano, when you push down the notes, it does two things. Number one, it causes a hammer, a felt hammer, to hit the string. So a piano is really a percussion instrument. And then it lifts up another hammer, which you call a damper on the top, and that lets the string vibrate. It keeps ringing. That sound keeps ringing, really, till it just dies out. It's a bit like a, a bell if you were to hit it and not to dampen it. Um, and if you push a pedal on the piano called the sustaining pedal, that lifts up all of the dampers. And then when you push down keys, it, those notes just ring on until they naturally die out. Now, on the pipe organ, because the air is uh, what causes the sound rather than a percussive uh, attack, it only sounds as long as I have my keys held down on the note. So if I push the key down and hold it, it'll keep playing as soon as I release that second it stops playing. So if I want to play legato on the organ, I have to use the, 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 uh, my fingers to hold those notes, and we call that touch. As opposed to a pianist who might play that with a sustaining pedal, but the actual notes without the sustaining pedal might sound like this. off the piano keys but you've got the sustaining pedal held down the sound still continues if you lift your hands off the organ keys the sound stops and that is the the most disconcerting thing for a pianist to come and play on an organ because you have to get used to playing legato and really holding those keys down to make a lovely legato sound but there are some organs and I would like to put it on the Kochmar um, so Foley Baker if you're listening there are um, the curators who did the rebuild in 2012 and there is a such thing as a sustainer on the organ, and you push a button, and it will sustain whatever chord you push down. And it's really cool for improvisation, because I might play this chord. 
nice and jazzy, but I would just push it and then the organ would keep doing it and that would leave my two hands free to play something else. And I've done concerts, especially in, in Germany actually, and, and thinking in Cologne Cathedral in particular, a wonderful um, organ there has a sustainer and so you push this down and then you can move to another keyboard while those notes are sustained. So maybe we'll get one of those. has. Um, well, I think the most important thing is to have people here. Um, I know that there are so many people across the state and across the country and across the world who really love this organ. They cherish it for all of those reasons that we discussed, that it's a great American masterpiece. I really think it's one of the great musical instruments of our time anywhere in the world. Um, and when I write my PhD thesis, that will probably be its subject. Uh, but it's lovely to be able to enjoy this organ as we're now through video and if you get a really good recording you can enjoy some of those acoustic qualities almost like you're here in the hall but it's never quite the same um, especially with pipe organs with orchestras with opera with string quartets with piano you can get a very close experience with a good pair of speakers or headphones with a pipe organ, you just got to be here there really is no substitute so I am looking forward to people being able to come here and listen to this organ in real time in person and as a performer, there is nothing like reacting to the energy of the audience. And in particular, that's uh, most prevalent when I'm improvising, and that's something that as organists we do a fair amount. And in this concert, I'm going to be presented, apparently, with a, an envelope containing musical themes um, that are sort of American, you know, they could be from pop music, they could be the national anthem, it could be just about anything. Um, and then I will make up a piece, maybe a symphony or a set of variations um, based on those melodies. So we, we talk about the um, America, America, and I'll show you what could happen maybe with that. America the Beautiful, the, the melody that, that we all know. Um, so I could easily take out uh, strings and just do this. example so that's uh, if we were in Paris in the 1950s that might be the kind of sound you would play and with those luscious harmonies and taking the melody and little bits of it little motives and um, repeating them and spreading them out changing the notes changing the melodies somewhat um, to create a new material from you know new wine in old bottles as it were um, old wine in new bottles no um, so so that's particularly exciting because when you have an audience present they don't know what's going to happen, and they know that you don't know what's going to happen because it's improvised, it's made up. And as the spirit moves me, I might do something like that, or I might do, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a big loud something sort of... play with those melodies and, and make up something totally new on the spot. So much more exciting with a live audience.
Cool. Absolutely. Well, as I mentioned, we are looking for submissions for those melodies. And the best thing is to send us an email or leave a comment in the chat here. This will be live and archived for decades to come. Um, and please do share this with your friends. We would love to see you here on Saturday, um, August the 21st at 7 p.m. Merrill Auditorium in Portland in Maine. And if you can't join us, or if you can and you want to hear it again, you can listen to it online via Vimeo and YouTube. And you can find all of that information on our website, www.foco.org. And you can buy tickets there or at the Port Tix website. Um, and we really look forward to seeing you then. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, James. Thanks, everyone. Now we have to turn it off.